Uh, this morning, as we get ready to go into prayer, before we do that, if you will repeat with me in your cards our mission statement. The mission of our church is to change the world one disciple at a time through preaching, teaching, reaching, and the practical application of the gospel message. On our prayer list, we ask you to remember Brother Trey Adams, Solomon Joe Adams, Katrina Adams, Milton and Cozy Houston, uh, Annette and Jeffrey Ballard, Jerry Houston, Annie Aiken, Deacon George Nipper, James Carter, Arthur and Patricia Lewis, Brian Brown, Jerome Davis, Dorothy Houston, Audrey Hall, Mike and Josephine Middleton, Miss Betty Johnson, Marcus and Clary Sturgis, Juana Rosna Mobley, Jay Moffitt, Willie Boyd, Miss Willie Brown, Dwan Johnson, Veronica Sims, the Nixon family, the Wells family, Monica Lubrinson, Smith and Long families of Jones Creek, Georgia, Jerry Witten, Candace Giles, the Demery family, the Sharp family, the Hawkins family, the Roberson family, the Pope family, the Munch family, the White family, the Thurman family, the Mackey family, the Middleton family, the Nully family, the Nipper family, Vanessa Jones and family, the Hall family, the Bush family, the Newsom family, Miranda Walker and family, the Joyner family, Arthur Jones and family, Nichelle Sharp and family, the Marriage Club and the Marriage Club founders, the Sonys, Anthony Chavez, Kayanda Holloman, the families of, of the late civil rights leaders, the Lewis family and the Vivian family, Donald Ford, Sharon Taylor, John Douglas, David and Brenda Graham, Wallace Demery Jr., T. Ramsey, Doris Moffin, Anna Blair and family, Ruth Williams, Brenda Palmer, Kim Hartley, Jeffrey Pope, Crystal Douse, Nicole Douse, Christina McZorn, Blake McZorn, Pastor Herman Bing and family, Robin Calderon, Cheryl Nixon, Natalie Saprice, Raymond Plum, Quentin Nash, Madeline, Lance Strahan, Ave Perkins and family, Kathy Hall, Wilma Moffitt, Karen Butler, Fahim Mathis, Sylvia Page, Pastor James Adams, Mary Brundage and family, Chelsea Jenkins, Mati, Matiti Howry, Tasha Hall, Debbie and Tosh, Warren McZorn, T. Ramsey, Sharon Ellis, Miss Bessie Nixon, Reginald Dodds, Jamie Young, Julius Howard, Lincoln Woods, Laurence Moffitt and family, Greg Morrison, and family, the Tanksley family, Pastor Claude Harris Sr. and family, Dr. P.K. Robertson family, Kendra and Wayne Jackson, Reverend Clarence Brown and family, Reverend B Reverends B.J. and Ruth Lockhart, Bishop Willie Jackson and family, William and Tamara Preacher and family, Brian Wilner and family, Pete McZorn, Michelle Lampkin, Charleston Lee, Kate Braxton and family, Pastor Montrese Mims and family, Sister Joe Nash and family, Zoe Newsom, Brian Miller, Lawrence B., Melanie Walker and family, Yolanda Reams, Courtney Johnson, Carson Washington and family, Jay Lewis and family, Pastor Alan Moss and family, the Millbrook and Morgans family, the Patton family, the Johnson family, Daryl Graham and family, Ruth Williams, Rosina Lattimore, Anthony Braddock and family, Brian Lavender, the Strahan family, the Rowe family, Rebecca Denner family, Mona Willette Dialo, Miranda Hines and family, Sister Jasmine Haywood and family, the Grant family, Reverend and Dr. Richburg and family, Diane Rhodes, the Smalley family, the Harmon family, Ernest Dudley, Vanika Mack and family, Danielle Harris, Kim Baxter and family, Chaplain Renee Bennett and family, Johnny Taylor and family, Baby Noah and the Lahumbu family, Jeff Smalls, the Stevens family, the Brinson family, Pastor Claude Harris Jr. and family, Lori and Michaela Allen, Vanessa Robinson, Courtney Burton and family, Donna Drayton, Pastor Gregory Fuller and Macedonia Church family, Friendly Church of God in Christ, Broadway Baptist Church, Historical and Missionary Baptist Church, your pastor and family. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. I need thee every hour I need thee. God, we praise you, we bless you, and we thank you for a day we've never seen before. We thank you, God, for the sunshine and for the heat. We thank you for this opportunity that even though our church building uh, has been burnt down that the church is inside of us and not the building. We thank you for an opportunity uh, to, to come on this second Sunday in this parking lot service. We thank you, God, for all that you've done. We thank you for keeping us through this week. We thank you, God, for a kidney for Jerry Houston. We thank you for a recovery for Sister Johnson. We ask now that you remember all of those families, God, that are in bereavement uh, as we pray. We ask that you will comfort them in a way that only you can, that you will give them that peace that surpasses all understanding. For we recognize that no human words can truly console a person who is going through the grief process. And so we ask you to do what only you can do, and then help us to do what we can do. 
We ask now, God, that you will bless every family that's represented in this parking lot, those that wanted to be here and those that cannot. We ask that you would continue to bless these services as we acknowledge you in all our ways. We lean not to our own understanding, God, but we ask you to direct our path. We recognize that if you don't take charge, God, that we're just simply wasting our time to be here. And so we ask that you would speak to me through me a word that would be relevant, a word that we can immediately apply to our lives, a word, God, for a time such as this, in a time of a pandemic, in a time of chaos, in a time of protest. And this year, 2020, God, what we say 2020 is perfect vision. And you are revealing so many things, not only spiritually, but naturally. Uh, things that we never believed would happen, God, are happening. And so we ask, God, that you would just continue to give us spiritual insight uh, into those things and how that we should respond. Help us to recognize and to fulfill your word through your son, Yeshua the Christ, through Ben Yahweh, that they that worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth. And so help us, God, not to just give you lip service. Help us not to give you emotional service, but help us to give you spiritual service that our souls might be lifted and that we might be those disciples that you are calling us to. And that as you told your instructed your son to tell his disciples that by this shall men know you that you love one another. Uh, let the words of our mouth and meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. God, you are our strength and our redeemer. In the name of Yeshua the Christ, we pray and we thank you. And the believers of God said amen, amen, and amen. Uh, we're going to go right into our scripture. We're going to let that prayer serve as our uh, pre-sermon uh, prayer. And we're going to ask you to turn your Bible, smartphone, smart devices to James chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 27. We ask that for your extended reading uh, that you would read the entire book of James. Uh, there's only, I believe, four chapters. Or is it five chapters? Somebody tell me. Um, it's only four or five, uh, uh, five, five chapters. So we ask that you, in your extended reading, that you read the uh, entire book. Uh, and so as we're reading from the New King James Version of the Bible in your private devotion, uh, you can choose whatever version, paraphrase uh, that you so desire. But James chapter 1 beginning at verse number 19 and it reads, let me get, five. it's five chapters worth, uh, alright, so uh, Beginning to verse number 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but, he, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. I think I'll read verse 26 again. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religious religion is useless. Verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Brothers and sisters, what we honor about the word of the living God is determined by the means from which we hear it. If we hear it with our head, I submit that we will process the word through the filter of our flesh, rejecting that which causes us displeasure, rejecting that uh, which causes us to be uncomfortable. However, if we hear with our spiritual hearts, then we crucify the flesh 
by honoring or doing what the Word of God instructs us to do. In his book, Spiritual Discernment, Watchman Nee tells the story of a college professor, and this is an abbreviated story because it's a very long story, but he tells the story of a college professor that was invited to speak at a prestigious university for an upcoming Sunday service. The professor was excited as many important and influential people would attend the service. The professor sat at his desk pondering with his head in his hands. What could he speak uh, on that would have a positive impact? What could he speak? What could he say that the people would receive his words in such a way that consequentially that they would admire his oratory skills? He did not want to make the same mistake a previous speaker had seemingly made. The students thought that this previous pr professor's message was old-fashioned and outdated. Those that were the who of who in the society presumed that the speaker was out of touch and not relative with what he had to say. As the professor thought of what topic he would speak about, it seemingly came to him. He would talk about uh, a subject, new teaching. He would use an appropriate verse found in the book of Acts as his foundational scripture as the college required that all speakers use a scripture for their foundational, uh, uh, for the foundation of their speaking. He begins to pull out his books, book after book, as he studied. But brothers and sisters, can I tell you that there was one book that was not on his desk. There was one book that he neglected to pull from his shelf. That one book that the professor who was going to speak a sermon on the upcoming Sunday did not pull out was the word of God. He had not pulled out his Bible. He was so involved in his studies that he failed to realize that his 11 year old daughter had come into the room, had come into his office and until she had put her hands on his neck. He hurried her away as he explained to her that he was preparing for an important speech for this upcoming Sunday. It was all that he could talk about. At dinner, he was preoccupied with the excitement of his upcoming speech, so much so that it consumed his conversation with his wife and with his only daughter. His daughter asked him, Dad, are you still going to take me up to the mountain so that we can see the cemetery and the old farmhouse like you promised that you would do earlier? He told her that it would have to wait uh, because he had to prepare for his Sunday address. After dinner, he went back to his office to study. The next day while he was studying, his wife interrupted him, said, Honey, I'm sorry to bother you, but our daughter is very sick. They called the doctors and he gave... He came and he gave the daughter a vaccine. However, the vaccine did not do her any good and she seemingly got worse. Rather, she became deathly ill. The professor called other physicians for a second opinion, but his daughter did not get any better. But she continued to talk about going to the hilltop, asking her dad if, if, if he would take her and if he couldn't take her, for him to go to the hilltop and, and take a look at the cemetery and, and the old farmhouse and everything would be all right. Uh, finally, a Christian doctor came to visit. As the town and the school and the students heard of the condition of the child, it quickly spread throughout the university. Uh, this Christian doctor went to the child's room to offer a prayer. And when he came out, he came out smiling. What did this Christian doctor know that the others did not know? What did he hear? What did this Christian doctor see? Could you imagine what was it that this Christian doctor said to this professor and to his wife? What was it that he did while he was in the room? How does hearing head, heart, and honor fit in this story. Well, our lesson today is hearing, head, heart, and honor. 
Let's dive right into the lesson for the day. In the book of James, in chapter number one, verse number one informs us that James, the brother of Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, Ben Yahweh, sends a message to the 12 tribes of Israel, the African Hebrew Israelites, if you will. And at the time of his message, they were a dispersed people or a diaspora that are mostly or were mostly marginalized. They were ostracized. They were deprived. They were disadvantaged. They were op an oppressed people, to say the very least. I'm just wondering if anybody besides Pastor M can draw a parallel between this diaspora of people, these African Hebrew Israelites, and the people now that live in these United States of America and the people that James writes to. In this message, James admonishes his listeners to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. These three steps form a foundation for the remainder of his message. Can I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that like any single-story home or skyscraper building, if the foundation is not formed correctly, the structure will always have problems and issues. It does not matter how lovely or beautiful the structure looks. Uh, it will always have problems. Conversely, when the foundation is formed correctly, the structure will stand the test of time. No matter how beat up it may appear to the eye, no matter how many storms may come against it and beat on it, it will stand the test of time. Brothers and sisters, if the truth be told, many of us are swift to speak. After all, we have a need, uh, we have a desire to be heard. We want to ensure that our right to express ourselves is not violated. Uh, after all, isn't it one of our constitutional rights? A large number of us have not been taught how to listen to understand. It is much harder for us to listen with compassion for the speaker. It does not seem natural for us to set our personal preferences, our personal educational needs, our opinions to the side long enough to put ourselves in the shoes of the speaker. This seemingly natural tendency contributes to our being quick to get angry with that which we disagree with, to that which makes us uncomfortable to that which we are ignorant to. The truth of the matter is, my friends, that our natural nature is contrary to the instructions that James gives to his listeners, and if you will, consequently to every born-again believer of Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, Ben Yahweh. What does all of this mean? I'm glad I asked myself that question. Even though nobody honked the horn, it means that many foundations in, within the church body need to be demolished and reformed. Could it be covered in the instructions that the Apostle Paul gives to the converts in Corinth when he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. That old foundation has been demolished. That old way of thinking has to change. That old formation has to be made new. He says, and behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Can it can I ask you a personal question today, my friends? How was your spiritual foundation formed? I think I asked that one more time because perhaps somebody didn't want to hear the question. I ask you, how was your found spiritual foundation formed? Can your spiritual structure stand the test of time? Can your spiritual structure stand the test of life? Can your spiritual foundation stand the trials and tribulation that will come against you? Can your spiritual foundation stand the test of ridicule? Brothers and sisters, what we honor about the word of God is determined by the means we hear it. If we hear with our head, 
I would suggest that we process the word through the filter of our flesh, rejecting that which causes us displeasure. After all, who wants to be displeasured? After all, who wants to be uncomfortable? After all, who wants to be convicted of doing something that they like to do? After all, who wants to be convicted of going someplace that they enjoy going? After all, who wants to be convicted of giving somebody a piece of their mind who deserve to get a piece of their mind? After all, why should I be uncomfortable? Why should I be the one that shows compassion? Why should I be the one that have tolerance? If we hear with our spiritual hearts, conversely, we crucify the flesh by honoring or doing what the word instructs us to do. Love our neighbors. Pray for our enemies. Do good to those that do evil towards you. We crucify the flesh we crucify the need for us to be heard we crucify the need for us to have our feelings and our emotions met can i suggest to you that james suggests that our spiritual foundation for his letter is to be swift to hear slow to speak and slow to get angry can i park right there parenthetically for a moment slow to speak swift to hear and slow to get angry. Can I say that some of our problems to include the pastor is that the reason we get angry so quickly is because we're too quick to speak and we're not slow to hear. Oftentimes the person may be saying the exact same thing we're saying, but what do we do? We only hear it through the filters of how we see it and not perhaps how they hear it. And then we get angry because they don't agree with us. Can I suggest that we ought to be able to agree to disagree and still get along? There ought to be something in us that is in common. The common spirit within us, the common Holy Spirit ought to be able to agree. For I heard the word declared that we ought to try the spirit by the spirit if it be of God. And if we can try the spirit by the spirit, then we ought to know that even if we disagree in our flesh, that the spirit of God is not our own personal conscience. It's not what we want to do. It's not what we want to hear, but it is the will of the living God. And the will of the living God, it doesn't change for Pastor M. It doesn't change for Sister Moffat. It doesn't change for Elder Hawkins. The spirit of the living God does what's good for the Father. Once, once the foundation has been formed, then the structure can be built through us setting aside our sin, soaking in the word of salvation, seeking the word through what we hear and see, speaking the word by saying what aligns with the word and showing the world through our actions. I think I'll say that one more time. I might not be preaching to nobody else but myself today, and so I'm going to read it one more time just for Pastor M. Uh, once our foundation, once my foundation has been formed, the structure then can be built. How is it built, Reverend M? It's built through setting aside the sin. It's built by soaking in the word of salvation. It's built by seeking the word through what we hear and what we see. It's built by speaking the word, by saying that which aligns with the word of the living God. And then finally, by showing the world through my actions. Well, Rev, how do I set aside all sins? Well, let somebody accuse me of just rattling on and not going to our text in verse 21a of our text. We read these words. Uh, 21a says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not an English major. I major uh, in business, but my English teacher did teach us that all is an inclusive word, that all means just that, all. There's nobody that is not included in all. How about the LGBT community, Reverend M? They're included in all. How about short people, Reverend M? They're included in all. How about the prostitute, Reverend M? Is she included in all? Yes, she's included in all. How about mama and daddy? Are they included in all? Yes, they're included in all, Reverend M. How about my wayward children, Reverend M? Are they included in all? Yes, they 
are included in all. How about my spouse who abuses me? Is he or she included in all? Yes, he or she is included in all. And all that he says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. And so whatever it is, uh, when I tag my all, it might be a different name than when you tag your all. I'm not going to go through a laundry list because everyone that can hear me, everyone sitting in their cars, everyone that will watch on YouTube, everyone that will watch on Facebook, you can fill in the own blanks of what is your sin that you need to lay aside. You can fill in the blank of what is the filthiness that is still residing in your life. You can make your own laundry list of the wickedness that still not only passes through your head and through your mind, but also passes through the actions. And so the first thing that we've got to do is that we've got to stop all the sin and filthiness and wickedness. Well, let's not keep you too long. The next thing that we've got to do is we've got to soak in the word of salvation. Yes, brothers and sisters, uh, you may tune in on Sundays and listen to a sermon. Yes, brothers and sisters, uh, you may be listening to the sermon in your car, but can I suggest that if odds are right and if uh, odds serve me correct, uh, the odds are that somebody that while you're even listening to the sermon now, you are preoccupied with doing something else. Uh, if odds serve me right, somebody may be thinking about what you're going to fix for dinner. Somebody is thinking about it's hot out here. Somebody may be thinking, well, I'm running my gas to run this air conditioner. Rev, I hope you hurry up and finish so I can get on back home. Uh, we, we need to soak in the word, not just hear the word. Well, what happens when you soak? Well, uh, perhaps I can use the illustration. When you take a shower, you just let the water hit you and run off of you. But when you want to soak, you fill the tub up full of water and you get in and you stay in for a while and you allow the water to go into your pores. You allow the dirt to come out. And so I believe that James suggests in the verse, in verse 21b, he says, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Uh, if I put it in my own words, he's saying, soak in the word of salvation. Don't just hear it, but let it creep down through. Let it cut through your head and reach to your heart. Uh, don't only just hear it. Don't only just watch it, but let it saturate your bodies. Let it saturate your mind. Uh, I wonder if anybody understands what I'm saying, if it's helping anybody that we need to soak in the word. Can I say that there's some folks that have let words soak in, but it wasn't the word of the living God. Could I say to you that the KKK has let negative words soak in to their mindset and that they believe that they are a superior race? However, before the 1400s and the Spanish Inquisition, there was only one race. Can I tell you what that race was? That race was the human race. It, it was because of the Spanish Inquisition that they needed to find a way to separate people so they knew who to persecute and they knew who to kill and so they came up with this concept of race but there was one human race well Rev where did that human race come from that human race came from mother Africa there was one race soak in the word of salvation and you can understand that there is one race soak in the word of salvation and you recognize that all of God's children regardless of what color they are all of God's children to how much they weigh all of God's children no matter how short or how tall they are all of God's children regardless to the religion that they attach to their belief in Yeshua the Christ and to Ben Yahweh are his children and should be treated equally Next, we should seek the word through what we hear and what we see. We should seek the word through what we hear, what we see, and what we hear. Uh, 
verse number 23 says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, brothers and sisters, there's an awful lot of people that hear the word, but there's not as many people that do it. James, the brother of Jesus, James, uh, the one who didn't believe until after the resurrection of his brother, James, who became uh, what we would term as a bishop in the African Hebrew church, he says, uh, the one that hears but is not a doer is like a man, and I'm going to make it inclusive, or a woman observing his natural face in the mirror. And we've talked about that. It's not like the cosmetic mirrors that you ladies enjoy today. It was a piece of tin, uh, and it had a distorted view. And so it didn't really give a good reflection. Uh, I'd like many of us don't give a good reflection of Christ. But he says, for he observes or she observes him or herself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man or woman he was. We ought to seek the word through what we hear and what we see. Can I tell you that I love to hear a good joke, Elder Hawkins. I love to take in a good movie every now and then. And I don't want to meddle with you and what you do, but can I suggest that our many that take in garbage on a daily basis well, what do you say, Rev? I take my garbage out to the street. I, I'm not talking about that kind of garbage. The kind of garbage I'm talking about is the garbage that you take in to your ear gates. Uh, talking about the kind of garbage that you allow your eye gates to see. And you think that there's nothing wrong with the craziness and the filthiness that you watch. After all, I'm just watching it on TV. After all, it's just a DVD. After all, I know the difference between reality and fiction. But can I suggest to you that the writer suggests that we ought to be careful of what we see. Allow ourselves to see and allow ourselves to hear. Uh, could I suggest to you that for some of you that are visual, uh, you get a vision in your head and you can't unsee what you've already saw. And while it may not be harmful, you may go to sleep and you see it. When you get up the next day, you can see it. When you think about it, you see it. Fortunately for those that aren't visual like me, that's auditory, I only see it when I see it. But I can hear what was said. And so there's a danger in what we allow ourselves to hear and what we allow ourselves to see. And I don't want to keep you too long in your cars, uh, but next we've got to move. You know, perhaps that this is how we build this spiritual foundation, this spiritual structure on the foundation of being slow to, to speak and being quick to hear and being slow to anger. We've got to speak the word by saying those things that align with the word. I think I'll say that one more time. we got to speak the word by saying that which aligns with the word. Could I suggest to you that you can say what's in the Bible without being aligned with what's in the Bible? I just want to throw something out to help somebody today, and perhaps you might get upset with me when I say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Can I tell you that Jesus was not a Christian? Somebody might be upset with that, Brother Leonard. Reb, how can you say that Jesus was not a Christian? Well, if you read your word, you know that in the book of Acts it says they were first called Christians in the book of Antioch. In the book, uh, uh, I mean, in the city of Antioch, it's in the book of Acts. And if they were first called Christians in the book of Acts, that means that Jesus had already ascended back to the right hand of the Father, which means that he had never been called a Christian because he was not a Christian. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if we're going to follow the way, the truth, and the life, we won't get hung up on this thing about Christianity, this word that was like the N-word, but now it's supposedly acceptable. But even if we apply the principles which are supposed to apply to the word some of us still fall short and we can say 
We can say what's in the Bible without being aligned with the Bible. The Bible said, and we know that God does not hear a sinner's prayer. That was a recording of the man that was healed whose parents didn't want to be excommunicated from the church. And so he said when it was asked of him, how was he healed? He says, I, what I know is that this man... Well, I was blind and now I can see. And he said, to whether he be of God or not, I don't know. But we know that God does not hear a sinner's prayer. But could I ask you, my friends, a question? If God doesn't hear a sinner's prayer, why am I sitting here in the heat preaching? Why is Lennon standing behind the camera sweating? Why is Elder Hawkins sitting aside of me sweating? Why are you wasting your time on this Sunday morning to come and hear a sermon? Because God hears sinners' prayers. And that is our hope. Our salvation is built on the rock that hears a sinner's prayer. And so we have got to speak the word by saying what aligns with God. How do we know what aligns with God? It's because we saturate ourselves with the word. How do we know what aligns with God? It's because we be in conversation with him and our spirit the spirit of the living God will agree with the word and the flesh will reject it. And so we must speak the word by saying that which aligns with the Holy Spirit. And could I tell you brothers and sisters that's easier said than done. Can I tell you that sometimes we get in our feelings? Can I tell you sometimes we get in our emotions? Can I tell you sometimes we get tired of being taken advantage of? Can I tell you sometimes we get tired of every time we cut on the news or look at social media, there's another black body being snuffed out. There's children uh, laying in the street with handcuffs on when the description of the vehicle uh, that was being driven by the perpetrator was a motorcycle but yet you stop an SUV full of youngsters and you pull them out and you make them lay down on the hot concrete uh, there you get sick and tired of being sick and tired and you want to do something about being sick and tired So we've got to speak the word. And even when that word hurts, we've got to learn again how to pray. We've got to learn how to peacefully protest. And when the time comes, we've got to learn how to physically protest. Physically protest with our words that align with the word of God and physically protest by our actions. Well, my final point so that we can get to our communion and show the world show the word by showing the world the word through our actions somebody used to say when I was growing up that talk is cheap uh, somebody would say uh, you don't tell me but show me and then those that are from the town of Missouri, they say which is the show me state. Uh, I understand the concept and that concept fits along with this final point. James suggests in verse number 22, he says, but, in other words, don't just be hearers. He says, but be doers of the word. It's more important to be a doer than it is to just be a hearer. And somebody say, well, how so, Rev? You already told us that we need to hear the word. We need to see the word. Well, I believe that the Bible says from this same writer that those that know to do good and they don't do it to them, it is sin. In other words, if you will accept my interpretation, what he's saying is that it's worse off for you to hear the word and then don't put it into action than it is for you not to hear the word 
and not know how to act. And so he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, because if you do, you deceive yourself. So in other words, you've got to let what you do, do your speaking. How many even know that there are some situations that you don't have to open up your mouth? There are some situations that just your facial expression will do all the speaking for you. There are some situations that what you do will do all the speaking for you. There are some situations that you can just turn around and walk off. And by you walking off, it says more than you could ever say by giving a piece of your mind. I'm not saying that there are not times that we need to speak. And James didn't suggest that we don't speak, but he said be quick to hear and then slow to speak. In other words, think about what you're going to say. Think about what you're going to do. And then ask the Lord, is it better to act without speaking or is it better to speak and to act I can't give you the answer for all of your situations brother I can't give you the answer for all of your situations sister neither can you give me the answer for mine but I know somebody that has an answer for me I know somebody that has an answer for you and that's called the paraclesis the Holy Spirit who came to guide us who came to teach us well perhaps Somebody's wondering what happened to the daughter of the professor. Uh, as we left you, the Christian doctor had come out to the room, had a smile on his face. He said to the professor, and to his wife, those of us that believe in Christ, believe that it's a beautiful thing when one of our sisters or brothers leave from this old miserable world and go to that life everlasting. It's a beautiful thing when our spirit meets the spirit of the living God. Oh, yes, perhaps some of you thought that there was going to be a miracle. Some of you may have thought that God would have answered the professor's prayer to heal his doctor, to heal this young girl uh, from whatever it was that ailed her. I believe it was some type of throat fever uh, that the writer says, the professor's daughter died of. But as I could regress uh, in between the time of death, the students had heard of the daughter's condition. And the students didn't just be hearers of the word, but they became doers also. They came and aligned themselves outside the window of this young girl and they begin to sing the words of a hymn written by none other than Alton John and I know somebody says what kind of words uh, did Alton John write uh, what kind of hymn uh, did uh, Alton John write uh, but he wrote the words uh, to the song to the hymn abide with me <laughs> Somebody today says, uh, abide with me, fast falls the eventide, uh, the darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. Uh, when others' helpers uh, fail to comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. Uh, the doctor paused uh, before he spoke. Uh, and then uh, he told uh, uh, this couple what I've already told you, that their daughter had passed from earth to glory, uh, that she had a peaceful look on her face, uh, and that she transitioned with a smile on her face. Uh, well, as you can imagine, the professor 
had prayed all he knew how to pray, yet it seemed as though God had not heard his prayer. He began to read that one book, Elder Hawkins, that he had not taken off of the shelf. He began to read his Bible that he might find comfort. He continued to pray that God would give him peace during this time of sorrow and mourning. He then recited the next verse to the lyrics of the song, I need thy present every passing hour. What but thy grace can foil the temper's power? Who like thyself my guide and stay can be? Through clouds and sunshine, Lord, please abide with me. And on that Friday, he made that trip that he had promised to his only daughter to the hilltop to look over the cemetery and the old farmhouse. But on this trip, he was accompanied by a small casket that was draped in white flowers. As he stood with his daughter in front of him and a crowd by his side, this professor who was going to preach something new, this professor that was going to preach what he would believe, a word that would make him look good, this professor who didn't want to seem old-fashioned, this professor who did not believe that the Bible was really the word of the living God, he stood there in front of the crowd, he stood there by his daughter's casket, and he confessed that he had not not believed in the Bible, the words that he read, that he preferred science over theology. He confessed that he was wrong. He confessed that he accepted that he accepted Ben Yahweh, Jesus the Christ, Yeshua, the Son of the Living God, to be his Savior. And before that all important Sunday morning sermon, this professor had made it to the hilltop. This professor had decided as he looked at the cemetery, as he looked at the old farmhouse. He decided as he said his farewell to his daughter, as he gave a eulogy he had not expected to give, he closed the eulogy out by saying the final verse of this song, abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. I wondered if there's anybody today that needs to hear this. Hold thou God thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks the earth's vein. Shadows flee in life, in life, in life, in death. O oh Lord, abide with me as I close my sermon. If we're going to allow the word of the living God to abide in us, we've got to be slow to speak. We've got to be quick to hear. We've got to be slow to anger. We must understand that our hearing, whether it be through our head or through our heart uh, will determine what we honor, uh, whether we honor our flesh or whether we honor the living word of the living God. Hearing, head, heart, and honor. We're going to ask that our deacons come now as we prepare for our communion. Rick, you want to give us a song? All the blood of Jesus All the blood of Jesus All Yes, sir, never pass the 
Lose his power. Lose his power, okay. <laughs> oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It shall never lose its power. There is power in the in blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. It will never lose its power. Oh, the blood of Jesus, singing oh the blood of Jesus, singing oh the blood of Jesus, it will never lose its power. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Don't worry about it, Deke. Just leave me there. We'll get him. In the blood of Jesus. It will never lose his power. Good brother. As the deacons are passing out the elements, let me go ahead and pray over them so that we don't prolong the time. Deacons, just continue uh, to, to, to share. Father, we bless you and we praise you. We thank you for this opportunity uh, for communion, for your word declares. As often as we do this, we do it in remembrance of you. Uh, it is an ordinance that we thank you that because of the blood, because of the cross, because of the work of your son, Yeshua, Ben Yahweh, because he was obedient to death. Uh, we're able to celebrate our salvation. We're able to celebrate uh, the grace and mercy that is extended to us uh, that causes us no longer to have to go to the priest, that causes us no longer uh, to have to have the priest go in the holies of holies, but the holies of holies has come into us. Now we ask that you would bless these elements, uh, this dry wafer and this juice as they represent the body of Ben Yahweh, to represent the blood of Ben Yahweh, the cost, the price that he play, paid to redeem us and for our salvation. We ask that you would do this in the name of Yeshua the Christ, and we'll give you the honor, the praise, and the glory. Amen. As they continue, I'm going to read the scripture found in Matthew chapter uh, 26. It says, Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. And as they were eating the Seder, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it. And gave it to the disciples, said, Take, eat this my blood, I mean this my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you, in my father's kingdom verse number 30 says and when they had sang a hymn they went out to the mount of olives and the final verse in that pericope says then jesus said to them all you will be made to stumble because of me this night for it is written i will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered this has been the word of god for the people of god from the man of God have all been served that would like to be served. Is there, is there anyone that, if there's anyone that has not been served, if you will blow your horns, the deacons uh, will, will come to serve you. With that, go ahead, take a moment and separate your bread uh, from your from your juice if you have not 
If you're ready, could I hear your horns? And on that day, he took the bread, which represents the body that was broken for us, not literally, but broken in the way that they beat him, the way that they marred him beyond recognition, the way that they put a crown of thorns on his head, the way he took webs on his back, the way slave owners would beat our ancestors. He said, this represents my body, which was broken for you. Take ye and eat ye all of it. In like manner, he took the cup. We don't know if it was the second cup, the third cup, or the fourth cup. We know it wasn't the fifth cup. But whichever cup he was, he blessed it. He says, this represents my blood, the blood of the new covenant. And that as often as you do this, you do show forth my coming. As often as we do it, it is our hope. Our hope in nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Our hope that the brutality will stop. Our hope that the laws will change. Our hope that we will be vindicated. Our hope that a change is going to come. Our hope that trouble won't last always. Will you drink with me and our hope? And they sang a song. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Save me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. Do you know it was the blood? save you can you sing it one time with me i know it was the blood i know it was the blood i know it was the blood save me one day when i was lost jesus died on that cross and I know it was the blood save me. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Next Sunday service will be pre-recorded uh, as we will uh, be out of town. God bless you. Thank you for coming. We love you all. Continue to keep us in your prayers. <laughs>